expectations do you really need, the values, and then resilience. And those kind of fundamental basics won't change with tons more information. You just have to be better at understanding these different elements to be a competent individual and also realize life's a journey. It's not about all this stuff. It's about you being the best version of yourself. So that is about character traits. That is about adventures, learning skills, having disappointments, coming back from failure. That's not going to change. All this other stuff is just an enhancement to have potentially have a better adventure. But of course, um, we work very hard in, in education to stop children being the best they can possibly be. Um, you know, if I take something as simple as the classroom environment, which I've been into over, well, just over 70 exam rooms in the last two years, I haven't been into one. I wasn't damaging the prospects of the children. They're, they're too hot too much CO2, the light levels are way too low because they've got some clapped out old projector that the bulb's going on so they've all drawn the blinds, you know, and and children are really struggling in school to be their best they can be. But of course what you've heard here is outside school, on the beach, lobbying parliament, scampering around all over the place. He can be stellar, but sitting in a, sitting in a room with the door locked, breathing in the CO2 or 30 other kids isn't. So in Twinkle, um, you know, which is booming at the moment. I mean, it's, you know, I'm a fan. Of, there's so much, I mean, with 10,000 pieces of, of resource out there, huge number. Are you optimistic? Do you feel the, the company is booming? Do you feel that learning is too? I think regardless of any pressures coming from above, any government initiatives, you'll still get really passionate, creative teachers in classrooms all around the world. And you will get creative, passionate children. And they feed off each other all the time. And I don't think you will... Yeah, I, I definitely have hope whilst you still have that situation. I can't see that situation going away. And as we move forward into a more technological world, people are starting to see the value in the emotional side of things, the creative side of things, the artistic side of things that they don't see being replaced by robots. So all of a sudden the bit that technology might replace isn't quite so important. That emotional intelligence, the well-being, support, you know, early teaching, supporting children into how to support each other, then brings it into the workplace when they're in the workplace and they have that emotional intelligence to know how, how important well-being is, how to support each other, which kind of goes further when you look at children like Finlay looking at how to support the planet. And I think that kind of feeling is growing as the technology increases, it's almost like technology is going to take care of the data side of things. But we need to look at the full, full no, I mean, Yes, you're, I mean, computers are really good at doing what they're told. They're really good at repeating things. They're really good at never being tired and just keeping going. They're really good at pattern matching. They're really good at remembering. So if that's all kids are doing, they've got no future. But what students are good at is, of course, ingenuity, curiosity, deep learning, collaboration, mutuality. Computers can't do any of those things. So, but the problem is, how do we move the world of learning away from those very repetitive things over to these new, well, old, actually, you know, creative, curious things without losing, without losing depth? Because you've got to know stuff. You're not going to get there without knowing something. We were, we were just chatting. I've just learned something about sharp behaviour I didn't know. Um, so, you know, every day, every day we learn something from each other. Really, really, really important. I went to um, a discovery workshop in, uh, in America. So, you know, apologies to anybody here from America. I'd stay. You know? <laughs> and uh, there was nobody in the workshop until 10 minutes before the end. All the American teachers came rushing in sat down, I thought, how curious, and then at the end they gave out the free t-shirts, you know. <laughs> yeah. They'd only come for the t-shirts, and I thought, that just felt to me like a disaster, you know, the only thing they could get from all that wonderful content was a, was a clean shirt, you know. But you must be optimistic, I mean, how many, how many screens, how many families, how many places do they see your stuff? You know? Well, I mean, discovery, as in discovery com communications, is in a, every country around the world, really, in every territory. But I think, uh, I think, in, in terms of optimism, I think it comes from two sides. From my point of view, I think there's a, a democratisation of education that happens through technology, and by that, people like Finlay are able to do peer-to-peer -peer education and kind of, dare I say it, bypass the classroom sometimes. 
Um, and I think, as you say, we need a very, very broad education and then students themselves selecting the areas of passion where they go deep. And then we learn from those which have that depth of knowledge. So that the Finleys of this world. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a democratisation that happens with, with media that is now in the hands of students around the world and including in, in areas that, that in many ways are, are relatively deprived because once the mobile devices become available, uh, kids have it in their hands more often. But then at the other side of that, picking up on, on Finley's point, uh, I'm starting to see more uh, nations introducing skills into curriculum and life skills. So we work very closely with the Egyptian government. We've helped them to develop a new national curriculum. We, we led the professional development for all their early years teachers, 80,000 teachers who introduced a new curriculum last year where life skills is a significant part of the curriculum. And that revelation that what you're not... You, you, you're not teaching kids just a set of facts, you're teaching them how to learn and you're teaching them how to develop as people and to make appropriate choices and how to collaborate in the future. And the fact that there is policy being made and recognising that for, for an education system to improve, it needs to actually give its students skills, not just buckets of, of, of irrelevant knowledge, unless it's connected with those skills. So I think it's having it in the hands of the students, but also leading through appropriate policy and where we try to provide the glue is getting the professional development across there but to it, get people to decide how to do it. Here's where it gets really tricky, is it? And, and Helen, you know, you, you, you'll know how subtle those cultural nuances are. You know, it's, it, in a, everybody's different. Every culture, I mean, Hullapool is different to Blackpool, it's different to Brighton, see where I live. You know, everywhere's different. So how do we, how do we as a media industry for children, how do we build those cultural nuances you know, if we believe, a, a, I love what they say in Saudi Arabia, a pot boils from the bottom up, you know, so it's a very democratic thing, I think, unusually. Um, but how, if that pot is boiling from the bottom up, how do we make sure that people's culture is represented, that the local, you know, your town is unique and very special? Um, how do we make sure it's still his town? Or the same is true of Floyd, some of the places you've been, you know, very cultural specific things but Helen how do we do that? I think personally at Twinkle we, we're in many countries around the world now and almost 50% of our users are outside the UK but what's really really important to us is that we get it right in the country where people are accessing it so all of our teaching contents that's written for countries outside England so even including Scotland and Wales and Ireland as outside England and Northern Ireland because they have different curriculum documents all, all of our content is written by teachers who have taught and live in those countries teaching those curriculum. So it's not, it's not us writing in England and then okay. trying to sell it to other countries. Uh, you know, our, our Australian resources are all written by our, our Australian teachers who are in Australia teaching in Australian schools. Yeah, some of my Australian schools are stage, not age. So, you know, you go as far and as fast as you like. You don't have to wait to move over. Finley's 11, but he could clearly be sitting with the 15-year-olds. But... You know, so stage on age is, is good there, but it's not. But, but, but there would be trees on here, probably, I suspect. Mm. Some of the places you've been, tough places. Mm. Um, and here we go. We're heading for a global curriculum, for sure. I used to fly on Sabina Airlines, you know, Belgian airline. They used to give you beer and chocolates because it was Belgian, you know. And if you fly to Australia, the Qantas, which used to be the Queensland and Northern Territories Air Service, it's nothing to do with Queensland, it was just a global carrier. So, you know, it seems daft, doesn't it, that you would have to be looking at the British curriculum, oh no, the English curriculum, the Welsh curriculum, the curriculum on the Isle of Man. We're going to head for a global curriculum for sure, and PISA, of course, is now not talking about, do you know, this maths or this physics. They're saying, what do you like as a global citizen then? You know, what do you like as a collaborative problem solver? How long do you think? before we get to a global curriculum, and that's for Andrew, and then I'm going to come back to Floyd and say, how's that going to play in Afghanistan? 
I mean, in terms of timeline for a global curriculum, I, I think there's there's so many other geopolitical issues that, that come into play about uh, vested interests, and I don't want to go too too controversial there. No, but I think, but I think in terms of the all asleep. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of the, uh, I think thematic global cu- curriculum is already beginning to be there uh, because of that sense of uh, the, the the reach that technology has, and the and the way that. Uh, Every nation is interdependent now that people are already seeing that need for an interconnected curriculum and so that internationally benchmarked and and obviously things like PISA helps for that. But also recognising, we were talking earlier, weren't we, a little bit about the changing economies in places like the Middle East where where they're recognising that that the the main source of, of wealth in that area is changing. So we need to change and become more global and I think... Uh, the, the, the things we're going through in the UK at the moment, I think we will come round to that sense that we need to plug into a global world uh, and that will, will drive the, the need for a kind of core expected set of curricula. But I think what you're also saying, it's quite important that we, we still celebrate our local uh, culture and that, that diversity doesn't just mean the kind of interesting thing of, of a diverse single classroom or a diverse single place. It means Ullapool. It means uh, the, the back streets of Cairo that I know very well these days uh, and, and, and the huge differences between there and it's celebrating all of those locations in, in the locality and 